The recent deaths by suicide of two North Country teenagers has people thinking about the dangers of internet scams. Separately, each teen was targeted by cyber criminals through social media, then coerced into sharing private information that the criminals threatened to expose publicly if they didn't pay a ransom. A couple of professors, experts in cybersecurity, decided to do something to help parents and kids to protect themselves. Taking action against cyber exploitation is our story of the day. Story of the day is supported by Champlain College Online, helping New Englanders advance their careers with certificates in business, cybersecurity, IT, and healthcare. Champlain.edu slash New England. I'm Celia Clark, and it's Friday, April 30th. First up, new details are emerging about the deadly shooting in Watertown on Wednesday. Police believe the suspect used a legally owned handgun to kill two former colleagues at a real estate office. The suspect later shot and killed himself. Emily Russell reports. The suspect in Wednesday's shooting was a man named Barry Stewart. He was a real estate agent from West Carthage. According to police, Stewart worked at Bridgeview Real Estate in Watertown until about a couple weeks ago. Police say video from Wednesday afternoon shows Stewart entering the Bridgeview office. Here's Watertown police detective Joseph Donahue. We know that Mr. Stewart was in the office less than a minute. In that minute, police believe Stewart shot and killed two former colleagues, 50-year-old Maxine Quigg and 53-year-old Terry O'Brien. The two were co-owners of Bridgeview. Donahue says the shooting was reported to police just before 2 p.m. on Wednesday. Our officers arrived. Uh, They formed tactical teams and cleared the building. And um, Mr. O'Brien and Mrs. Quigg were found uh, deceased in their offices. Donahue says both victims were shot multiple times. There was at least one other person in the building at the time of the shooting, Donahue says. That person was not injured. We are not identifying that person. Uh, As you can imagine, it was a very traumatic event for anyone to go through. Police say the suspect, Barry Stewart, was seen on video leaving the office in his gray pickup truck. After an hours-long manhunt, state troopers spotted him driving about two hours northeast of Watertown. While attempting to pull Stewart over, troopers say he drove off the road. Officers found Stewart with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. He was later pronounced dead. Here's Detective Joseph Donahue again. We are speculating that the handgun that was recovered um, in Franklin County in Mr. Stewart's vehicle was the same weapon that was used at the crime scene on Clinton Street here in our city. A weapon, Donahue says, that Stewart owned legally. Police are following multiple leads on a motive, including whether it had to do with Stewart leaving Bridgeview Real Estate. Donahue says they're also investigating whether anyone other than Stewart was allegedly involved in the deadly shooting or knew about plans in advance. We want to run down our leads, meet with the families, and, and go with it from there. A vigil for the victims and their families will be held at Watertown's Public Square this Saturday at 7 p.m. Emily Russell, North Country Public Radio. University professors in St. Lawrence County are figuring out how to help parents, kids, and teachers work together to understand and combat cyberbullying. Minhua Wang and Kambiz Gazanor are cybersecurity researchers at SUNY Canton. They started working on a public webinar about cybersecurity in direct response to the news in March that two local teenagers ended their own lives after someone online harassed them and demanded a ransom. 
They talked with Monica Sandresky about their webinar on cyberbullying prevention and intervention. The tragic events, especially in the local area in March, the two deaths of our two teenagers, I believe the local community right now, is, everybody is understanding that the cyberbullying is becoming a real threat to us. And they already, I should say, murdered our two people. A lot of hackers are looking for the side of ransom. So those two tragic deaths, actually, I believe it started on Facebook of cyberbullying, but finally it reached the stage where the hackers somehow they successfully got those personal pictures or maybe videos from victims, and then they started their real attack, which is a ransom request. If they got a ransom a request of, for example, three thousand five hundred dollars. If you don't pay the ransom, they are going to expose your personal pictures or videos online. So they got threatened. And especially in this community, a lot of our school uh, students, they don't expect that happening. They are not prepared for that. So they are actually feeling shameful to talk with their parents. That's why they are under the huge pressure and finally made a decision. So I believe our community needs to probably take more actions. One of the big things we have to do is we have to make sure we have some programs in place to prepare for the future. So we need a cyberbullying awareness training and education to our kids, and also we need parents aware of the cyberbullying. Having some kind of education program for students, I mean, can you give me some of the details, how you would imagine one that would be effective looking like? The New York State already starting to propose K-12 through computer science and a digital fluency standard. What that means is for all the kids starting from kindergarten level, they are going to be educated. Cybersecurity knowledge, computer knowledge, networking knowledge, and cyberbullying is one part of the standard. But that kind of education will be only fully implemented by fall of 2024. We cannot wait until those education happen. You know, until this education can get up and running, it seems like parents also need to and want to be involved too. How do parents talk with their kids about this? Kids, yeah. Mm-hmm. It actually re- requires a lot of people to be involved. And I believe uh, Combis may be able to deliver uh, a little bit more about what he is doing right now on security and the privacy issues. First, thanks, Professor Wang. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, I believe cyberbullying is one of the pieces of the puzzle. And we look at Internet safety. And we're not talking about just choosing a strong password. When we're talking about Internet safety, we talk about the consequences of your actions in social media and internet space. I've been studying children's online privacy from parents' perspective. Sometimes their own actions are unintentionally compromising their own and their kids' privacy. Oh, how are they doing um, that? Many parents put the information about themselves and their kids, um, something we refer to as PII or personal identifiable information. Your date of birth is not going to change 50 years from now. So if I'm, as your parent, putting stuff out there, I am putting you at risk. But as a parent, I I don't know that this is risky. Uh, They're not doing it intentionally. But sadly, the consequence is basically harmful. It used to be you could see that parents post stuff about their kids on social media from birth, But now we see that there is this ultrasound pictures of parents-to-be that they posted on social media. So I always say that um, sometimes kids have no choice, and even before they are born, they have digital footprints. So this is not something that we as researchers can do. Yes, we are coming up with new methods. We are talking with school teachers. We've been in contact with um, school admins. We know what they want, and we are helping them. But... But this is something that we can't just do it on our own. We need parents' help. We need, we need a change in uh, basically mindset. We need to make sure that um, Internet safety is number one top priority. And many of the teachers 
and some of the parents um, are on board with this. We have to start from kindergarten level. That was cybersecurity professors Minhua Wang and Kambiz Gazanor at SUNY Canton, talking with Monica Sandreski. You can always get more regional news on our website, ncpr.org. And all that local reporting, it's only possible because you help pay for it. It's the last day of our spring fundraiser. The public radio journalism you trust is listener-driven and listener-supported. Please join your neighbors and help keep local journalism strong in our region and for our region. Make a donation right now at ncpr.org slash give. Music today was from Christopher Watts of Canton and David Archibald of Kingston, Ontario. I'm Celia Clark, North Country Public Radio.